There we go. Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church in Grayton. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. We need somebody needs to turn on the lights. We have the lights on the stage and we have the lights at the entrance, but we don't have the lights so that Kitty can read what she's reading. <laughs> Okay, let's go ahead and go to the, the Lord in prayer. Most Heavenly Father God, you know I know that I say it every week. Oh, but God, you are so awesome and so wonderful. I just don't say it enough. So I'll say it again. Lord, how wonderful and awesome you are. Thank you so much, God, for your love. You love us so much. And you care about us so much that you gave us your one and only son that he made, that he was, that he would be the uh, propitiation, the uh, sacrifice, the expiation uh, that was needed to satisfy you, to help us to have that close relationship with you, Father. Lord, we know that without that sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, God the Son. Lord, we know that we couldn't have that closer relationship with you. So we thank you for that, that you loved us so much that you did that. That your son loved us so much that he did that. Father God, we ask that um, you be with all of those that are not here today. Lord, we ask that they will be available next week or the week after that. And we'd like to have fellowship with them, Father. And we would like to get together with them, have fellowship, worship you together. As as we as we sing the, the hymns of praise and worship to you, Lord, we ask that you know our hearts and that you accept them as part of our offering to you. That you do everything for us, Lord, and we want to put ourselves forward to you and show you how much we love you, Lord, how much we praise you, Lord. Lord, as we're reading your word today, as um, Michael, Pastor Michael is sharing with us those words that God has put on his heart, Lord, we ask that you open up our eyes and our heart and our in our ears, help us to have that discernment. May the Holy Spirit, may the Holy Spirit just move through your word, Lord. May he move through your word that we may understand what it is that you would have us to understand, Lord. Because we know that that's what it's all about, is that it's worshiping you, praising you, and hearing from you, Lord, through your word, through the movement of the Holy Spirit, through your different instruments, that being Michael, myself, anybody, Lord, that we're in fellowship with here today, that you will use them to speak those words, Lord, that you would have us to understand and to know. Lord, as always, we, we ask this in and through your Son's precious name. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Okay. Uh, it's a little cold. It's been a little cold. It's been done right chilly. I was uh, in Ross uh, near San Rafael uh, the last week or so, and it's every night it's gotten down into the mid 30s. And even though they have uh, heat there, it still was cold in the house. Just that chill, it's that kind of cold that just gets into the deepness of your bones. I'm thankful for the shelter that I have, and we pray for those who don't have that shelter, Lord, that you keep them warm. Okay, um, our first hymn is number 406, The Solid Rock, The Solid Rock, number 6, 406.
don't think our music system can read music today. <laughs> that is a quarter note. It is not a whole note. It waited a whole four beats to do the chorus. Okay, enough complaining. Thankfully, we have the system. We'll soon be going back um, to combination of the digital hymnal and the guitar. I'm finally able to stand on solid ground. And, uh, you know, it's been, oh, just, it was uh, November the 1st of last year that I broke my ankle. Uh, and I'm feeling really solid right now. Uh, and I'll be able to actually stand here long enough with the guitar. Because, you know, you get to move while you're playing the guitar. So I'll be pulling the guitar back in. Uh, maybe even adding some piano. I've been working on the piano, so uh, we shall see how that goes. You know, looking at the words in this song, wow. Talk about um, <laughs> doctrine. Especially the, la uh, the last verse was, all the verses are just filled with doctrine. But that last verse, when he shall come with trumpet sound. You know, when he comes, we will indeed be hearing, no matter where you are, you will hear the shofar, the trumpet, sounding. And we will know that he has returned. Everybody will see and everybody will hear. And that is when indeed we ourselves will find, will find out if we are indeed in him. And that's indeed where I pray that all of my loved ones and all of your loved ones are in him so that they too are found. Uh, the second, in the second stanza, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. And why are we faultless to stand before the throne? Because we are in him and he, his blood was sacrificed so that we would be able to stand before the throne and that he is, he being Jesus Christ, that he is our advocate. He will stand with us before God on that judgment day. And then, of course, the chorus, On Christ, the solid rock, we stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. And again, I pray um, for all of our loved ones who are not in Christ, um, that they too will know and appreciate what solid ground the rock feels like. Okay, number two, our second hymn is number... Uh, 407, just turn the page, one over, and there we go. Because he lives, because he lives, and this, of course, in the, the solid rock and this song, indeed are all having to do with faith in Christ, faith in God. Uh, Pastor Sherman today is on faith. Let's try. 
new message in the in the song because that's what this is is all scripture and scripture continues to live and breathe and, and speak to us and so thank you holy father thank you holy spirit for moving through the words of these songs lord and speaking to us thank you so much you were so awesome and you were so wonderful father um in the first verse in that second um, stanza where it says, He lived and died to buy my pardon. What, as we were singing it, what I was reminded of where, where he said on the, uh, where he said on the cross that it is finished. Remember in the Gospels, it said, It is finished. And the word there in the Greek is testai, or forgive me if I'm pronouncing it wrong to all the Greek scholars out there. Um, but basically what that meant was paid in full. When a person owed money to somebody or to the bank or to a, a business, in the biblical times and uh, maybe even in the industrial age, when you paid your bill in full, they stamped something like that on the door. Paid in full. And that's what Jesus' death on the cross did. It paid our part in, in full. So thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Uh, it's now time for our um, tithe and offering. Um, uh, Pastor Michael, if you would do the offertory prayer, that would be wonderful. Thank you, sir. Heavenly Father, we, we just thank you for the enormous blessings you, you give our little church for its uh, financings and uh, financing and offerings that we get each week and the ability to maintain our ministries and maintain your property and be able to do our missions outside of here. We just ask for a special blessing on all those who are able to give in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Number uh, 422, surely goodness and mercy. You know, a lot of churches will just use the, uh, for the song, they'll just use the chorus, surely goodness and mercy. Uh, but I like our hymnal, it's got the actual, it has the actual verses. Number 422. Oh, 
feeling a chill here in the air. I'm going to go ahead in a second and turn the heat back up. We are leaving it uh, at a lower thing when we're doing the music because it seems to uh, bother the uh, sound on our recording. Uh, so the sermon's pastor is on faith, and he's going to be in John 11, 17 through 23. Pastor Michael. Well, good, good morning, everybody. It's a nice, clear day outside, just a little bit on the uh, chilly side, but um, other than that, it's, it's quite nice. So we're going to be talking a little bit about faith, and sometimes we have a tendency, or some people have a tendency, to put faith in people rather than in God. Um, example that might be that a lot of us uh, have actually been told by some government officials we are to put our faith in in the government. And to give you an example of what can go awry if you do that is maybe uh, unrealistic expectations. For example, uh, many of us were told that we're going to get an 8.5% increase in our Social Security payments. And I, you can imagine the joy when I saw that yesterday when I got my Social Security statement online that I was getting a $289.40 increase in my Social Security check. And then I looked at the bottom and it said that my Medicare policy, that is Medicare premium that the federal government charges, was going up $289.40. So, if I was one that put faith in government, I would have been disappointed 
because I would have had an unrealistic expectation that the government was telling me the truth. Reality is, they weren't. My, Medi my uh, Medicare premium went up equal to the cost of living uh, increase we got, which really meant I fell behind in spending power on my check more than I normally would fall behind. But that's putting faith in government, putting faith in man rather than faith in God. Well, when we look at the miracles of Jesus, we, we will notice there's a pattern to his miracles. Frequently, we don't even realize there's a significant difference in the types of miracles. For example, the miracles of Jesus around uh, uh, Galilee were quite numerous. And the miracles around Jerusalem actually were more illustrative. Think of it. In the near, inner near Jerusalem, he would heal a man who was crippled over 38 years, or he healed somebody who was blind from birth. And there's other healings he does, and these are frequently done on, sa on the Sabbath to illustrate that God can do anything at any day of the week. And what better way would there be, or what better day, to give glory to God on the day of the Sabbath? What we need to understand is the effect that faith has on us and that salvation provides eternal life in Christ. And of course we get that for faith and belief in Christ Jesus. So if you open your Bibles at John eleven seventeen, if you want to follow along. And the first thing we're going to see is that uh, we see that comfort comes from our faith in Jesus. And that we can be comforted by our faith in Christ Jesus. Here are the verses 17 through 20. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Now, so what we see here is that people came to comfort Mary and and, and Martha due to their death of their brother Lazarus. Now, if you remember in the, in the Gospel of John, when Jesus and others were at the, the home of Mary and Martha, Martha stayed in the, basically the kitchen area of being a, uh, dealing with hospitality, and Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to, to uh, his teachings. But here we find the opposite. Martha goes out to talk to Jesus and Mary is staying in the house. In Israel, a tomb was usually a stone uh, sepulcher, that is, and these are common types of graves back then, they would be a cave of rock carved out for, for, the, uh, for the body. And then a large rock would be rolled in front to keep wild animals or grave robbers out. Now the mention of the fourth day is very significant. See, the Jews in that time did not embalm the dead. So by the fourth day in that climate, the body would have been in a state of rapid decomposition. And since many Jews came to comfort the loss of their brother, this would include, uh, this would indicate that Mary, Martha, and of course Lazarus, they were, uh, you know, brothers and sister, or brother and sisters, they were a prominent family. And it would not be out of reason to conjecture that they were within the Jewish hierarchy in some form. Now, a funeral procession of the grave could include relatives, friends, and sometimes, if you had the money, hired mourners. Imagine hiring somebody to mourn for somebody else. Mourning would usually last several days after the funeral. So it was quite an event. And when you think about Jesus, and, and they're there again, I believe it's the Gospel of John, where it talks about people who want to follow him, and somebody says, I want to stay behind to bury, bury uh, my father or a relative. He, he says, you know, you don't have time. Let the dead bury the dead. Because the person would not be available for ministry because it could be quite a while before they're available. Now, the mention of the Jews being present brings out the, the, the attention, the great risk or danger that awaited Jesus in coming so close to Jerusalem. See, if you remember the events or read about them prior to this, in the Gospel of John, just before this, the, these verses take place, uh, the religious leaders wanted to stone Jesus. 
and he left with his disciples. So coming back, they're putting themselves in danger. And with the Jews present, it would almost be certain that religious leaders would know that Jesus returned to the area. Actually, we're told about this in John chapter 11, verses 45 and 46, after Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. The verses. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them about what Jesus had done. So the religious leaders knew what Jesus had done. He'd raised somebody from the dead. Now Mary's displaying uh, her grief in a uh, quiet and contemplative manner. She's staying in the house. But Martha, on the other hand, is more aggressive and went out to meet Jesus. Directly the opposite of the time they're having the dinner inside the house. Now you show your faith in Jesus when you are calm during times of stress. You know, there's an article I read of something that occurred uh, years earlier in Guatemala where a 13-year-old uh, Bethany Thomas opened the gates so her mom could drive the car into the guest house driveway. And then she noticed a man pointing a gun at her head. Her mother... Karen Thomas was an international mission board missionary to Guatemala. And Bethany heard her mom scream and saw her struggling with another man who was trying to steal the car. So Bethany, the man, this is a 13-year-old, ran out to try to help her mother. And she yelled out, Mom, it's going to be okay. God is with us. And as she entered the car, and then she entered the car to help her mother. At that point, the car... Jackers shoved the mother, Karen, out of the car and it sped off the two men and her 13 year old daughter in it. Bethany started praying and noticed the two men were cousins. I guess they're keeping the business and the family. Bethany asked one of the men to stop cursing and then proceeded to lecture him about the cursing and his involving in the involvement in the carjacking. Can you imagine the faith this little girl had in Christ Jesus? She's in a car, two strangers who basically have kidnapped her, stolen the car, have guns, they're cursing, and she's now lecturing them about their language. Uh, Karen and her husband Jeff realized that Karen's cell phone was still in the car, so Jeff called the phone and one of the men answered it. Uh, kind of shows somebody is not working with all thrusters, I think, where if you steal a car and you answer the phone when it rings. But Jeff convinced the men to release their daughter, and they released her near a fast food restaurant. She told the guard there that she was just kidnapped and about her uh, mom's car being stolen. But the guard would refuse to let her use, this, use the restaurant telephone. This wasn't interested, didn't believe her, so he didn't, didn't even let her use the telephone. Matter of fact, she approached other people in the restaurant, and none of them were interested or willing to offer any help. But Bethany did notice a man who was on the phone, his own cell phone, and he ended his conversation with, God bless you. So she asked, and then he asked her how she, how she was doing, was, and what's going on, and he let her use his cell phone. He was a pastor. This event was many years ago, and by age 19, Bethany had a ministry reaching out to those who are in distress. That if she had a ministry at age 19 to comfort those who were in distress. So she displayed, she displayed her faith in Christ by remaining calm when she was under the stress of a carjacking. Now as we move on, we'll see in verses 21 to 24, where we see that it's through our faith we know God can do anything. Think about it. What can God do? He can do anything. And we need to have faith and believe that he can. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. And Martha said, I know that he'll rise again at the resurrection at the last day. So Martha believes Lazarus, her brother, will rise again, but that'll be the last day during the end times. So Martha's not rebuking Jesus, she's actually agreeing he will rise again. She's showing a repressed reproach and a persistent faith. She's demonstrating her great faith in his power to heal. 
based on what she says in verse 24. Martha said, I know that he will rise again at the resurrection at the last day. Now, we know she's not saying Jesus could raise her brother Lazarus from the dead. It's at the resurrection of all the believers in the end times. And this is actually reimbursed, reinforced actually by what she says in verse 39. Then Jesus, angry in himself again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, he already stinks. It's been four days. So there again, affirmation that the bodies decompose rapidly. Martha was in fact saying she knew Jesus had a special relationship with God. And out of this relationship, she believed that some good could come out of the sad event through his prayers. What she did not realize was that he was God. And when Jesus said Lazarus would rise again, he was not speaking of the end time resurrection. He was actually speaking of in the next few moments. Martha was thinking of the general resurrection the Pharisees believe in and taught about the end times. Now, do you have ever a discussion with someone only to find out the two of you were talking about two different topics but using the same words? This is what we have here. Resurrection at the end times versus a resurrection in the next few moments. Now, you display your faith and you believe God can do anything. We have an example of that in Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Uh, it's one of the times Jesus was in Capernaum. It's at the north end of the Sea of Galilee, right next to Bethsaida. And there was a centurion thereby who had a servant who was ill and about to die. The centurion had heard about Jesus and sent Jewish elders to request Jesus come to save his servant. So here we have a Gentile who has a relationship with the, with the religious leaders in the area, the elders, and actually contributed money, I believe, to help, help their, uh, build their, their uh, synagogue. And he asked them to go out and uh, get Jesus and ask him to come and save his servant. So he actually has faith that Jesus can heal. When Jesus came close to the home of the centurion, so he, he was going to go ahead and take care of it, he going to give him, uh, answer his request. The centurion showed respect to Jesus by having another servant come out and tell Jesus he was not worthy to have Jesus come by. And this is very important because it's showing respect to Jesus in the Jewish culture. It would be it would not be appropriate for a rabbi or a Jewish person to go into a home of a Gentile. It would not be appropriate. And so the centurion showed respect to him by saying, you know, I'm not worthy to have you come by. Stay, stay away. But then he goes on to tell him that, uh, or through his slave tell him, that Jesus uh, could cure the servant that was ill from a distance. Just like he tells his soldiers to do this and they do it, he believes Jesus could say, you are healed from a distance, and he, would, he could heal. He didn't have to come in the home, did not have to come and defile himself. So Jesus responded by saying to the crowd uh, something quite quite interesting in Luke chapter 7, verse 9. He says, I tell you, I have not found so great a faith even in Israel. So he sees greater faith in a Gentile than he does in the Jews. So when the servants returned home, the sick one was already healed. Think about it. How much do you have how much faith do you have in Jesus right now? And then finally, look at verses 25 through 27, where we see that we who are believers know salvation is through faith and belief in Christ Jesus. As believers in Christ Jesus, we know our salvation lies in Him. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, ever. Do you believe this? Let, yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. So Martha confessed her faith in Jesus. 
This is the fifth of a series of seven great I am statements that Jesus makes in the scriptures, actually in the Gospel of John. And these are the same words, that is, I am, that God says to Moses during the burning bush incident where when Moses is called into ministry. Exodus 3.14 God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So Jesus is now moving Martha from an abstract belief in the resurrection and end times to a personal trust that Jesus can alone raise the dead. Jesus can. So Jesus is telling her of the need to have faith in him. Eternal life is through belief and faith in him. The Son of God, Christ Jesus, is God incarnate. That is, God in human form. And only from Him, the resurrection of eternal life can be obtained. He can give life at any time to anyone He so chooses. There is no barrier to Him other than our lack of faith and belief. Jesus, of course, then at that point asks a question He so often does to those He discusses things with. If she had faith in Him, and if she responded with a confession of faith, the reason Apostle John wrote the Gospel the gospel of John was to bring people to faith. John 20, verses 30 and 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe in Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. Her confession, the same is preached by John the Baptist, as well as the disciples, and examples in John 1, 34. John the Baptist says, I have seen and testified that he is the Son of God. And so the response that Martha gave is, is emphatic. How emphatic is your confession of faith when you tell others about Jesus? So your witness to others shows your faith in Christ. Now, Acts chapter 4 gives us an example of displaying our faith. After the resurrection, John and Peter heal a man who's been crippled at, by the temple grounds. And he's crippled and he's died by the temple grounds begging for money. Uh, then Peter and John, after healing him through prayer in the name of Jesus, Preach the gospel at Solomon's colonnade that's inside the temple grounds. And the scriptures tells us around 5,000 people end up coming to faith. So the temple guards arrest them. And the next day they're put on trial by the same religious leaders who had condemned Jesus. Now Peter did the speaking for both he and John. And he proceeds to preach the gospel to those who were prosecuting them. Those who had earlier condemned Jesus. And he ended his statement with verse 412. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people, and we must be saved by it. They're saying, if you want to be saved, you want to be resurrected, you want to be in God's kingdom, you're going to have to put your faith and belief in Christ Jesus. No exceptions. Nowhere else. They were then released but were instructed to no longer teach or preach in the name of Jesus. So what do you think they did? They continued to preach and teach in the name of Jesus. Acts 4.33 And as the apostles were giving testimony of great power to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was on all of them. So we know that comfort comes from our faith in Jesus. It's through our through our faith, we know that God can do anything. We who are believers know salvation is through faith and belief in Jesus. How do you show your faith? If you've not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is an excellent time and an important time to do so right now. May God bless you. Have a blessed week. Thank you. As always, thank you, Pastor Michael. And remember that you don't have to be perfect to come forward. Nobody is perfect except Jesus Christ.
Jesus Christ is a come just as you are, God. Announcements? Uh, well, the first announcement uh, that's not in the bulletin uh, is that uh, today is Ernst's birthday. He's, I don't know how old he is, but I know that today is his birthday, so uh, 73. he's 73. So, Ernst, when you watch this, if you watch this, um, there was your brother who gave away your age. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Ernst uh, uh, regretfully is not well, and so hopefully he will uh, be better later on today uh, and can uh, enjoy his uh, day of birth. Speaking of day of birth, uh, believing that... Uh, That uh, conception begins uh, at the, that life begins at the day of conception. Uh, one of the things that I um, think would be fun, and I've done it once, and I haven't, uh, and I can't remember what the results were, uh, but I have to do it again because I have a birthday coming up myself. Is counting back nine months, like whenever your birthday is, counting back nine months. As your day of conception, you have your day of birth, and how interesting it would be to consider what your day of conception was. It's not a completely accurate. We know it's nine, at least nine months. Um, and I and that came across to me. Uh, my dear friend uh, Jerry, uh, who's with the Lord now, he uh, when he was in hospice, and I went over to visit him. Uh, he said that he said, you know, Charlene, I've been thinking a lot. Not about the day I was born, but about the day that I was conceived. Uh, and I just thought that was an interesting, an interesting aspect. If life indeed begins at the day of birth, on the day of uh, conception. Um, other announcements is we have potluck uh, right after uh, this, but it'll take us a, a little bit to get everything set up. We don't have anybody in the back working on setting it up. At least I don't think we do. Unless God brought us an angel to do the setup. Um, on Sunday mornings, we are you know we have Bible study starting at 9.30 and it goes till 10.30. And we are right now, we're in the letters of John. We're in 1 John 3. A very a wonderful study. And then on Wednesdays, I believe from 7 to 8... We are in the book of Revelation, so that uh, both studies are very, very, very uh, revealing. Uh, both books or letters, um, believing to be written by the same John. So it's interesting to look at uh, look at all of it. It's just it's just so wonderful um, how God, how the Holy Spirit moves through God's Word, uh, and how the Holy Spirit moves through. John. Let's see if there's anything else happening in the church. This worship service on on Sundays at eleven o'clock, as you know, because you're here. And then uh, uh, praises, and then prayer. Uh, praise for God's provision of so many things for our church. Just too many uh, things to be thankful for. Uh, but brings to mind the uh, song, I Count Your Blessings. But no, we're not going to do that song. Uh, that would have been a good lean-in. Uh, and then uh, prayers, uh, praise from my friend uh, Julie Cassidy. And I, I, I believe I mentioned it last week. Uh, but she has, uh, she had metastatic cancer, stage four. Uh, less than a, I believe, of, according to the doctors, less than a 5% chance of survival. And man, God's just... Knock that medicine cancer right out of the ballpark. So I uh, praise God for that. And, I, and I, I pray that she realizes that it is indeed God who uh, did that, along with the, you know, the ability that he provides different people and their giftings of, of uh, you know, being good at medicine and healing. So very thankful for all of that. 
Uh, prayer, uh, and uh, Doug, earlier we've been praying for his mobility, and he shared uh, with me earlier today that um, he's seeing some mobility in his knee. So what a praise that is. Just a wonderful praise. Uh, prayer. Of course, again, we uh, keep Ernst in prayer as he's kind of not doing well today. Uh, praise God, though. Uh, God will uh, make a way, one way or the other. And we have to remember that, to always remember that God's will is God's will. So we pray uh, in God's, that it be God's will that Ernst will recover well today. And we continue to pray for uh, Doug's mobility. We continue to pray for Charlene's eyes. She's um, having issues with both of her eyes. And um, I can imagine that that's very concerning. You know, we take for granted our eyesight when we have it, but when it starts to go, we take it not so much for granted, but we're, we hope and pray um, for the healing of that. Um, uh, last week, uh, Sunshine had mentioned, I can't remember the people's names, but... Corey Cor and her child, and they have a safe place to live now. Thank and, God, praise. And, and the heat's working. And John, is the husband's name John? No, Richard. Richard for his reconciliation with God. We can, we'll continue to... Um, keep that in, in prayer, that he have reconciliation with God. So praise God for uh, the mom and the, and the son and that they, have, uh, that they do have a safe place to stay and uh, continue prayer for Richard. That he, uh, and, go ahead. and we'll also put Corey's mom on the prayer list for okay. sobriety and to be clean off of the drugs. Oh, yes. She's on Xanax, and she's drinking. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's add um, Corey's mom for her sobriety, that she's clean. I have that prayer for several people in my life, So, and God knows who they are, so um, I pray for them all the time. And, you know, all things are possible through God, um, especially with sobriety, uh, I have, I know a lot of people who got sobriety, praise God. My mom, when she died at age uh, 75, I celebrated 35 years of sobriety. Uh, I remember her when she was a drunk, and then I remembered her when she wasn't a drunk, and I preferred her not as a drunk. Um, hallelujah. Yep, hallelujah, praise God for that. Um, uh, my, my friend Julie Dean uh, we've been praying for her for her um, cancer and uh, the surgery that she had for it, the lumpectomy. Um, the cancer, praise God, is uh, is all gone. And, but now she has an infection at the, the surgery site. And um, I believe it's a staph infection, actually. So um, I ask that we continue to pray for that. Uh, we prayed last week for, and the week before for my sister Joanne, um, who came down with COVID. Uh, she had uh, she had just gotten her last booster, so she's right up to date with all her shots. And uh, yet, the it still came and got her. So, uh, but praise God, she's doing really well. She felt well enough today to to go to church, and she's not testing positive uh, anymore. So she'll be going to. Uh, She'd be going to my sister's family, uh, my other sister's family, for Thanksgiving. And then, um, sad news, sad for us, but not for him. Um, Don Doss, who uh, would visit us every every uh, potluck Sunday, <laughs> uh, he used to sit right over on the side that Michael's sitting on, about five rows back, with his wife Sharon and with uh, Barbara and Dick. And... Uh, I can always remember him. I would look and I would see him when we were doing the hymns. He's got a deep voice. I could hear his singing, praising God. And uh, he always has a smile on his face when he was singing. Uh, so I, I miss that. Um, but he went to be with the Lord on October the 31st of this year. Uh, and so for him, that's a wonderful thing. He's, he's with the Lord. 
um, for Sharon, his wife, and for us, we, we start our season of grief. Uh, and especially for Sharon, his wife, now she now has rest from the 36-hour day as a caregiver. Um, and so we ask for healing for her and that, uh, comfort for her as she goes through the grief. Uh, and if you'd like to send her a card or anything, um, just let me know and I um, can get you her address because I need to send her a card and I don't have her address. So I, I will get her address and I will send her a card myself. Um, okay, I think that's it. Unless anybody else uh, has a, another prayer or praise. Uh, and you can always yes. text. Go ahead. Yes. Pizza's on its way. I should be there in about eight minutes. Okay. Um, safe travel for for um, Sunshine. Uh, and she's <coughs> going to be with us. Praise God for a potluck. <laughs> I, I would, yeah. I just couldn't get there in person faster. <laughs> I have commode duty today. Oh, okay. <laughs> she has commode duty today. All right. Um, and our closing hymn is number 410. It is well with my soul. Number 410. Amen. I get there. I'm prepared. Trying a new way of holding the hymnal here. And I forgot what I did. And the book is sliding. Give me just a second. Oh my goodness. My stomach is growling. If you're wondering what that noise just was. <laughs> I guess because I forgot to eat breakfast. All right. Um, number 410, It Is Well With My Soul.
shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Hmm. Amen. We're going to talk about a, a lifter up there. Wow. It's just this, this one in, uh, in the garden. Uh, two of my favorite songs. All right, I trust everybody has a wonderful Thanksgiving. I'm thankful for each one of you. God bless you.